Here is our lesson for 1.7. So 1.7 in geometry, we're going to talk about deductive structure. So this is a little bit more about that structure of a proof uh, and what that's all about. So uh, we talked a little bit about it in 1.4 and 1.5. We kind of flopped over to paragraph proofs yesterday. So we're getting back to that structure of a two-column proof and everything that goes with it. We're going to give you a little new vocabulary today and really just solidify that because that structure is something we're going to be using all year. So our focus for today is just to recognize that geometry is based on deductive structure and that this is made up of terms, postulates, definitions, and theorems. So some new vocab going on there. And then just understanding the characteristics of theorems and the ways that we can use them in proof. So that's what we're really looking at today. Before we get into that, though, a little vocabulary review for your warm-up today. Uh, hopefully you've tried this already. If you haven't, though, if you're in presentation mode on your slides, if you take it out of presentation mode, you should be able to move each of those pink boxes into its correct blank there to make those sentences make sense. So go ahead and give that a shot, and then I'll tell you the answers. All right, so... Uh, if I look through this list here, I have a blank is finite, a blank is made up of points, a blank has two endpoints, and a blank has a vertex. Now, if we look through what our options are, I have angle, point, line, and segment. So I'm not sure about you, but the one that jumped out to me first was has a vertex. There's only one thing in here that has a vertex, and that is an angle. So the angle you should have dragged over to put in this bottom spot right down, uh, right down here. An angle has a vertex. Let's see. Well, what has two endpoints? That's another one that jumps out at me. The two endpoints, two endpoints would be a segment. A segment has two endpoints. All right, now I have a point and I have a line. And my two that I have left is a blank is finite and a blank is made up of points. So finite means um, ending. It has, It is finished, right? That there's only that and that's it. Um, and that definitely does not describe a line. A line is infinite, not finite. So a point is finite. That should be the thing that goes up top. So the last thing that I have is a line. A line is made up of points. How many points does a line have? Two, three, four, a hundred, two hundred? A line is made up of an infinite number of points. All right, so uh, we don't always think of it that way, that it's made up of a whole bunch of points, but it really is, right? Like, the, think of a number line. Think of all the numbers on there as points. But then remember that if I have the number 1 and the number 2 on my number line, I have, you know, here's number 1, here's number 2. Well, I could put a point in between it. Oh, yeah. That would be one and a half, right? But then I have a point here and a point here and a point here and a point here. So all of those itty bitty numbers are actually points and that's why we have an infinite number of points. A line is made up of points. All right, there was our warm up with our vocabulary. Let's talk some more vocab for our lesson today. So the big thing that we're talking about is that structure of a proof. That structure of a proof is called deductive structure. It's not really some vocab that we're going to grill you on later, but that's just what it's called if you were wondering. So remember we talked about those logic statements. Logic statements, again, these are anything that we write in if-then form, right? So this deductive structure is based is the structure where you start with something you know for sure and you build on it in a specific way that's easily followed, right? If this is true, then this is also true. If that is true, then this is true. If that is true, then this is true. So it all depends on previously proven uh, things or things that we all can assume to be true. So when we do that specific structure, we have to have really good vocabulary. So we use a lot of terms, right? We usually define those terms for you, but we don't just want to say this thing or that thing. We want to have good vocabulary, this point, that segment. So that's what we mean by terms. 
Now, postulates is a fancy word that I'm sure you guys haven't heard before. Postulates are assumptions. We're going to assume that a line is straight, right? That's, an, uh, that's a postulate. That's something that we don't have to argue over. It's something that we can all agree on. So there are a few of those things, although we really try to limit those assumptions um, as much as we can. But there are some things that you just can't really explain, like that a line is straight. It just is, right? So those things are called postulates. The two biggest things that we have are definitions and theorems. So here we have definitions, and then we have theorems as well. And we've actually done both of those things already in class. So an example of our definition, if two angles have the same measure, then they are congruent. That's a definition of congruent, right? We did that way back at the beginning. That's a definition that we've already talked about. Uh, and we've already done a theorem as well. A theorem that says if two angles are right angles, then they are congruent. Notice, this isn't saying what a right angle is. It's just saying something that we know to be true about right angles because we proved it, okay? So that's the difference. Like a definition is saying what something is. What is congruent? It's when they have the same measure. A theorem is something you know to be true that you've already proven previously. So that's what deductive structure is based on, and we write in that if-then form as much as we possibly can, except for those postulates, and we always use good vocabulary. We're using those terms that we talked about. All right, so we, we kind of know all that stuff already, and once you and when you've written a couple two-column proofs, then you notice that we have a couple different versions of these if-then statements, right? So the first one that we talked about was just a conditional statement, anything that we can write in if-then form, right? Um, we say a lot of times, we'll say, if P, then Q, okay? So P and Q are just placeholders, just like just like variables are in algebra, right? If something, then something else. Uh, if Evan stays awake, then he will learn math, right? There's an if-then statement. It doesn't have to be a mathematical statement to write it in if-then form. Uh, we have a little bit of um, notation that we write sometimes if we're trying to kind of quicken things up and, and, and really get through it fast. So we have this notation P, oops, I should use the other color, sorry, P, and then this double arrow, and then Q. And what that double arrow means, this double arrow means implies. So P implies Q, or if P is true, that implies that Q must also be true. So that's what that double arrow means. We don't use it a lot, but sometimes we do. The book sometimes uses it even more than we do. So just so you know what that double arrow means. It means if the first thing is true, then the second thing is also true. So the conditional statement is if P, then Q. All right, now what we've talked about a little bit in our other problem, in, in 1.4 and 1.5, we started talking about the reverse, right? The reverse of that statement. Well, it actually has a name. That name is called the converse. So the converse is when we switch the order and we flip-flop the if and the then. Notice in the converse I have if Q, then P. So if Evan learns math, then he will stay awake, right? So the original one was, if Evan stays awake, then he will learn math. In this one, I have, if Evan learns math, then he will stay awake. Now, are these necessarily true statements? Maybe not. Hopefully, maybe not. Uh, but you can see kind of how they connect. So the original conditional statement, if P, then Q, uh, when I have the converse, I flip-flop the order. So I start with the then part, and then I get to the if part. So I switch the if and the then. So Q implies P for my converse. So, you know, just some notation, a little bit confusing. But if we go back and we just, all we're doing is we're putting a name to that reverse that we were talking about in the last couple of lessons. So I'm actually going to go backwards 
going to go back up to our examples here that we just talked about for our definition in our theorem. So let's go back to our definition here. Our definition was if two angles have the same measure, then they are congruent. Let's write our converse here. See if you can write your converse. Flip-flop the if and the then. So the if part was if two angles have the same measure, then they are congruent. So in my converse, I'm going to start with if two angles are congruent, then they have the same measure. That's the converse of that definition, right? So if I look at it again, I had my if was that they had the same measure in my original. The then was that they are congruent. So now in my converse, I have that they are congruent first in my if part, and that they have the same measure is my second part. Is that true? Let's think about that for a second. If two angles are congruent, then they have the same measure. That's true, right? Uh, there's no possible way for two angles to be congruent and have different measures. So this is something very interesting about definitions. We say that definitions are always reversible. So definitions, oops, I already have that color. Uh, definitions are always reversible. And by reversible, we mean that the converse is also true. So if the original statement is true for a definition, it always is, then the converse is also always true. That's pretty cool about definitions, right? But that's just because you can order a definition in either way, right? If I know they have the same measure, then I know that they're congruent. If I know they're congruent, then I know they have the same measure. So definitions are always reversible. Let's look at our theorem here. Let's see if we can write down the converse of our theorem. If two angles are right angles, then they are congruent. Let's write the converse of that one. So again, my if part, if two angles are right angles, and the then part is that they are congruent. So my converse would start with if two angles are congruent, and the then part, then they are right angles. All right, so I notice I, my if part from the original is that they are right angles. The then part is that they are congruent. So in my converse, the if part is that they are congruent, and the then part is that they are right angles. Now let's think about that one for a second. If two angles are congruent, then they have to be right angles. Can I have two angles that are congruent that are not right angles? Sure, 45 and 45, 20 and 20, right? So the converse is not true. That doesn't mean that the definite or that this theorem isn't true though. Just the converse is not true. So we would say that this theorem is not reversible. Meaning the converse is not true. And that happens sometimes. So definitions are always reversible. Theorems are not always reversible. Theorems sometimes are reversible. There are some theorems that are that the converse is also true, but not always. And so whenever we bring up a theorem in class, we'll always talk about the converse and decide if it's true or not and if we can use it. Uh, so that's just a little tricky thing we have to make sure that we are aware of. So theorems are not always reversible. Definitions are always reversible. So just know the difference between the two. But that is something interesting. Whenever we say, hey, this is a definition, what does that mean? It means that the converse is true already, uh, already no matter what. All right. So we got a lot going on with our structure today. Uh, we talked about this new vocabulary of converse, right? So here's a couple more for you to try just to make sure that you can take an original uh, conditional statement and then write the converse. So first one is if the measure of an angle is 180 degrees, 
then the angle is a straight angle. Hmm, maybe you can think in your head, like, is this a definition or is it a theorem? Go ahead and see if you can write the converse and then decide if it's true. So the converse for this would be if an angle is a straight angle, then the measure is 180 degrees. Is that true? If an angle is a straight angle, then the measure is 180 degrees? You bet. No matter what, always and forever, that is true. Yes, it's true. And if you think about that a little bit, why is that true? Well, this was actually the definition of a straight angle, which means that the converse has to be true. So that's why this is true. It still could have been true if it was a theorem, but uh, that's why we knew this one was true no matter what, because that's the definition of a straight angle. All right, how about the second one? Ah, a non-math related one. If you live in Atlanta, then you live in Georgia. Go ahead and see if you can write the converse and then decide if it's true. So the converse for this would be, if you live in Georgia, then you live in Atlanta. Ah, so the original is definitely true. If you live in Atlanta, then you live in Georgia, assuming there's only one Atlanta in the whole world. But the converse, if you live in Georgia, then you have to live in Atlanta. Is that true? No. You could live in some other town in Georgia. Uh, I have to think of a name of a town. Greensboro, I believe, is in Georgia. So you could live, or you could live in outside of a city. Uh, you could live somewhere else in Georgia. So there's an example of um, a conditional statement where the converse is not true. So just remember, if you can think of one exception at all, then it's not true. True means always, forever, no exceptions whatsoever. So when you're kind of trying to decide if it's true or not, sometimes true does not count as true. Okay, so just think, keep that in mind. And it's kind of cool, right, that these don't have to be math related. This is a structure you're going to use all the time. In fact, a lot of geometry students like to ask me, Mrs. Kariva, when are we going to use proofs in our real life? And my answer is always, you know what, it's not going to necessarily look like these two column proofs in your life. But your boss is going to come up to you and say, hey, can you give me an answer for this question? And you can't just say, well, here it is because I think so. You have to have it based on facts, right? How are you going to build up that understanding in your boss that you know what you're talking about and there is no way that you're wrong? And the way is using this deductive structure. Base it off of things you know. Use that if-then form. I guarantee you now once you know it, you're going to start hearing yourself use it in other places like English and science. And it's a wonderful structure that you can use to prove your point. Your lawyers out there, you get ready. All right? So this is kind of fun especially when you start talking the non-math versions too. Okay, so that was really our lesson for today. So geometry is based on this deductive structure. It makes proofs easier to understand and makes sure that they're accurate. Definitions are always reversible, meaning the converse is true. Theorems are only sometimes reversible, but not always. So that's why we're going to talk about the converse for each and every theorem we go over in this class to check and see if it's true. So your homework today from the book, page 42, a lot of these are just going to be, here's a conditional statement, can you write the converse, and is that converse true? So just to be ready for that, okay? So you got some homework, you got some extra practice there uh, using that deductive structure.